Well, we've talked about a lot of different things on our program over the years. We've covered as many varied topics as there is uh, sand in the sea bed, uh, and that is because we're interested in exploring the truth wherever it lies. So that's why we bring you things like groundbreaking new physics. We talk about is it possible to have anti-gravity technology? Are we ever going to get our flying cars? We talk about that. We go in, in search of answers for nutrition. We investigate linoleic acid and omega-6 seed oils and the nutrition world we're in. We also get into things like human nature. We get into human desire. We get into anthropology, current events, everything. You know this show. And one thing we like to re- hit back to is, is to come back to our roots, to make sure that we stay grounded, and that is to talk about the land, to talk about how to grow your own food. One of the things we've done on this program, we've talked to folks like the legendary Joel Saladin, who's a great iconic farmer, regenerative agriculture farmer. He's done a lot of work in uh, helping people understand how to homestead and how to do regenerative agriculture. But today, I wanted to turn our attention more to plants And that's why I'm glad to have a returning guest. He joined me in radio years ago when we were just starting off at WFLA Orlando. But now he joins me again for a deep dive look at how to heal the soil. We have with us Dana Venrick. How are you doing, sir? Oh, great. I'm glad to be here and so good to see you, David. Yeah, it's great to have you. So we we really want to talk about the basics today and learn because we're going to try to do a lot more on this topic. We've, we've had, like I mentioned, folks in regenerative agriculture as it pertains to cattle and chickens, but not so much. We've not covered as much as we'd like uh, on this program, how to take care of your garden, how to grow good uh, fruit trees and crops and all kinds of things. And it all comes back to the soil, doesn't it? It does go back to the soil and the microbes in the soil. Yeah. It's very important, you know, to, see the activity of the microorganisms and the life in the soil because they really uh, make everything work and generate those ionic forms that roots of the plants actually take up and really cause all the great uh, growth of plants and production by plants. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about your background, first of all, for those, I I know you well, but for those who are are just learning uh, who you are, Tell us a little bit about your background. You were a botanist by tra- training, right? That's true. But I grew up on a farm, so I'm grounded in agriculture. I grew up on a farm with cit- uh, citrus groves and uh, with uh, cattle and uh, with with trees, you know, pine trees, forestry. So we sold timber, sod, and cattle, and we had 150 acres of orange groves. Uh, there was some grapefruit in there too. So I, I had an epiphany, you know, during the time that I was helping manage the grow with the family. And we had a situation back in the uh, 70s and the 80, 80s with the freezes. And we had some severe freezes. But before that freeze occurred, we had a situation where the grove was greatly, greatly damaged, you know, by frost. And uh, there was no response. The trees would not come out of that uh, situation. But I'd like to discuss that more later. But, you know, after working on the farm, I went to University of Florida, got a degree, Bachelor of Science in Education, majoring in biology. Then I went to graduate school. Uh, to and got a master of science. I received a master of science in botany, with with uh, uh, actually my research work was on plant physiology and the selective uptake of minerals, specifically potassium versus sodium, from the nutrient solution, and and the mechanisms involved in that uptake. And it got also minors in chemistry, fruit crops, education. And so I've seen it from both angles. And actually, I learned more after graduating and after returning to the University of Florida, get, getting a, a post-baccalaureate in, in uh, agricultural education. And I taught school for a while. I worked for the uh, University of Florida Extension IFAS for 10 years, 2001, 2010. Before that, I worked for the Department of Agriculture. I taught school 
and uh, did uh, some work, you know, privately. Ivan was a head landscaper over at Hyatt Regency Hotel at Disney, making my own fertilizers and creating some amazing flowers with amazingly larger, more colorful flowers that the uh, tourists admire there. So I've got a lot of experience in a lot of different ways, and I know what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I have to tell Can you. I talk folks, about the epiphany I had. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us the epiphany. Oh my gosh, you know, this, I don't remember the exact date, but it was just a frost on this grove, you know, down in the flat woods of, of Lake Wales and Winter Haven, there in the country. And it was two different blocks a 17 acre block and a 50 acre block. And it was just a frost, but the ice formed, then the sun hit the trees, and the trees were just, hammered literally with that frost when the, when the sun melted that ice and so if the trees had been healthy i realized later it wouldn't have affected the trees that much but the trees were in such poor health as far as nutrition that they never recovered they did not recover this happened in february we Fertilize again with the fertilizer we were using that I now realize was pretty much worthless. A 16016 that consisted of ammonium nitrate, potassium chloride, and uh, unavailable forms of iron and some boron that is available. But that was all. And so nothing happened with that application of fertilizer that was recommended by the fertilizer rep in March. And so no flush, no new growth at all. And then we were getting really, really uh, concerned. And so we got to fertilize again, was the mentality at that time. So we use the same terrible fertilizer again in the first of June and nothing happened. No new growth, no budding, no flush, no bloom. And so we were panicking at that point because the trees were obviously going to die unless we did something differently. And so I, when I was working for the Department of Agriculture before that, I had seen some organic groves that flourished and through the freezes. And so I said, we got to try that. And so I made up a, a witch's brew, if you will. Uh, the rest of the family considered it to be a witch's brew of like fish emulsion, seaweed, blackstrap molasses, and organic trace minerals, and, and, uh, and, and, and black humates with fulvic acid and humic acid and some NPK and some conventional NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Well, I convinced my oldest brother to drive the tractor if I would spray the grove. So we did, we made up this very smelly brew and I sprayed the trees. It took two days to spray this entire grove in, in uh, about the, the middle, it was the middle of, of June. Well, guess what? The trees started to recover and by the middle of July, this is no lie, the trees came out with the most beautiful flush and bloom I'd ever seen in any grove. It was amazing absolutely mind-boggling and so i've never seen a grove bloom in the middle of july before and it was the most beautiful flush and bloom i'd ever seen and it's all because we sprayed that very uh, concentrated combination of the organics i just mentioned and so we still got a big crop even though the fruit was a little bit late on these hamlin oranges and still made a lot of money. Otherwise, we were gonna to have to push the growth. This was a real epiphany of the power of bioavailable organics. And I didn't realize all of the things involved at that time, because I was, uh, you know, led, led astray, you know, by the college education, you know, it was all just chemical. And then with, with later uh, things that happened, I, I realized, it's more than just the product or organic, but what you do is stimulate all the microbial life, the, the mineralizing bacteria, 
and all the other uh, beneficial, like the fungi, the beneficials, and Actomycetes and the uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, all those things together are really actively making those minerals available in a form, in an ionic form, either cations or anions that the roots can take up. Well, um, anyway, I'm enjoying this conversation. Because yeah. Now I get a chance to tell really an amazing story. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to go there. But first, let's just start with the basics that I want my audience to think about is that I've been able to meet some of the best folks in the fields of various subjects that we study. And I have to say, you know, when it comes to politics, you got to have Ron Paul. And I've had Ron Paul on two weeks ago. I keep, always love having him on. When it comes to the understanding, you know, your, eco, your economics, we go to the Mises Institute. We learn from folks like Jeff Dice. When it comes to learning about, you know, regenerative agriculture for cattle, we go to Joel Saladin. When it comes to understanding plants and how they work and understanding the soil and the microbial life, you're going to have to go with Dana Venrick. And that's why I have him here. So I want you to listen to him, what he's saying, whether you're a gardener, whether you want to start a garden, whether you want to start a homestead or you are a homesteader, whether you're a longtime farmer, uh, whether, you know, you're, you work in a monocrop industry or whatever, I want, there's something you can learn from here because he's going to start with the basics. Once you get the foundations right, then you can really have an opportunity to to do something really special. But it takes, it takes, you know, it's the same way I, I use the same metaphor for human health. One of the reasons why we're sick is because our soil is so depleted. We all know that, but we don't know what to do to fix it. And there's a lot of BS sellers, you know, in the world of fertilizer, unfortunately. But, you know, in the world of plant health, it's very similar to human health, isn't it, Dana, that... No matter when you're sick, with when you're sick, right? You get blood pressure issues or sugar issues or whatever. They just give you a drug, allopathic drug, which masks the symptoms, so you feel somewhat better, but you don't really. And you never address the systemic problem. But that same exact phenomenon is happening today, folks, in the world of agriculture and the world of plant health, not just in human health. It's so important to understand that the same deep capture of special interest controlling. What we understand to solve our body's health problems, that same deep capture phenomenon happens in the world of nutrition for plants and and uh, and, and dealing with disease management in plants. And, and the reason why this is important is, Dana, it's not just, and I think this is what I want you to cover first if you can, it's not just about organic, is it? There's a lot of nonsense in the world organic too. Oh, absolutely. It's all about, you know, understanding the situation that you have with your plants in the soil. You know, what is the uh, total situation in the soil? What is the life in the soil? And once, once you realize, you know, you're really more than just a, a person growing plants. You're a person really tending the microbial life and the life in the soil. You're actually... Uh, uh, a microbe farmer, if you will, because you feed the microbes properly, give all the things they need in bioavailable forms without over putting too much or too little. It's like anything else, like a diet. You don't want to eat too little. You got to have sufficient calories, but if you overeat, then your health goes downhill the other way. So it's yeah. got to be in that sweet zone of bioavailable nutrition that is based on comprehensive, accurate soil testing that really gives the proper diet for all the microbials and life in the soil that are just working feverishly in that soil with great power uh, to make those minerals available as cations or anions that the roots actually take up. You Once tell you us realize that, yeah. it becomes like an epiphany so this is going to be like a basic, some of this will be basic 101 science, like we're taking our first science class. So what is cationic and cations and anions? Can you tell us what that is and the basic explanation for that? Yes. Uh, when you put out a fertilizer, it's a compound. It's like ammonium nitrate, potassium chloride, uh, which are very, very water-soluble forms, you know, that uh, really dissolve and... Uh, it's, it's very, very injurious to the microbes. So they have very little chance to do much digestion and, and availability because 
with the first rain of irrigation, it leaches right through. So to properly feed those microbes, not only you need bioavailable forms like uh, potassium sulfate, potassium magnesium sulfate, which they call KMAG or SPM, and uh, keyserite, which is a naturally mined magnesium sulfate, forms that are bioavailable and slowly released so that you have a steady diet. It's just like a person. You don't want to eat every three months. You want to eat every day. But unless you give the microbes everything they need based on the soil testing and bioavailable forms, the microbes will have a, a feast one day after you rain, after it rains or irrigates, and then they're starving until you fertilize the next time with those cheap things like we were using in that grove I mentioned, the 16016, uh, which are very high salt index and, and very soluble. And so bingo, they're all gone. And so you lose the microbial life that are really keeping everything available on a 24 seven basis that is taken up to keep the plant healthy and productive and so, super so today's monocrop culture thriving. doesn't really have much use for bacteria in the soil, does it? I mean, obviously, bacteria is always going to be in the soil to some degree, but monocrop agriculture traditionally is trying to kind of force its way into the ground and out in a kind of sterile environment, kind of like a hospital, right? They're trying to sterilize everything as much as possible to keep away from uh, you know, diseases because these little seeds they're using or plants are so are so vulnerable. They're so weak, right? They're cut. Well, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you've got to really uh, have a like a balanced diet, if you will, for the microbe like you do for yourself. Yeah. It's very, very important. You know, like it's really sad, for example, uh, one strawberry farm I'm familiar with when I was working for the extension service, I went to visit along with some other extension agents. And uh, they start out by putting all these treacherous chemicals. It might be sodium bromide or some other chemical that completely sterilizes the field. And so that kills all the microbes, including the beneficial. So, and every week they nuke it, if you will, with chemicals that keep killing everything, including the good guys along with the pathogens that are destructive. And so but the only food the plants are getting is what you put in the fertilizer. And the fertilizers they were using were very soluble and they were only getting partial nutrition of partially what they needed. And so I took those strawberries home and the same day by Providence, if you will, uh, another grower I'm very familiar with gave me a, a quart of organic strawberries. They'd grown organically like I had worked with them to tell them how to do to grow organically. And so I put both of these boxes of strawberries, a quart of the conventional strawberries and a quart of the organic in the refrigerator. And uh, I, I started eating a little bit of each. I stopped eating, you know, the... Uh, the conventional because they didn't taste as good but after three days all the conventional strawberries were rotting yeah and the organic berries were still very solid and sweet and delicious in fact i had to throw away the conventional strawberries after three days i kept eating the organic strawberries and in 30 days i finished the last strawberry Wow. And it was still delicious. It was firm, a little bit sweet, but still perfectly edible because they were using, you know, super nutrition, bioavailable 24-7 nutrition with bioavailable nutrients with good biological life in the soil that made a strong berry as opposed, you know, that the others were just hanging on for dear life, kept alive and producing with just force feeding, you know, with steroid-like uh, fertilizer. But that was a dramatic example right there. You know, if you have good nutrition, organic and, you know, some conventional that's bioavailable and doesn't uh, have a high salt index and destroy the microbial life, then you're going to have really strong, healthy 
disease-free fruit or plants. And so what we're about is growing properly, whether it's organic or a combination of organic conventional with good bioavailable minerals, low salt index that are continuously available 24 seven, instead of like feast or famine with just highly soluble salt index of over a hundred, like potassium chloride, it's saltier than salt. Yeah. Sodium nitrate is a standard for the salt index. That's a hundred, yeah. it's hundred percent water soluble. Right. With a very high salt index. Potassium chloride or muriate of potash in, in most conventional fertilizers has a salt index like a 116 to 125. Ammonium nitrate, which is very typical, like in a, for example, a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, the salt index of 105. So both of those ingredients will kill your microbes, good and bad, and the first rain irrigation, everything is leached below the root zone. So the plants don't get very much. On top of that, the fruits are injured with the toxicity of the ammonium and the chloride. It's like putting together bleach and ammonium in, ammonia in the bathroom. Would you do that? It's yeah. deadly. Yeah. Why are we using fertilizer like that? That's not fertilizer. That's just, uh, that's false. Fertilizer. How many people are using these types of fertilizers? Well, most people, most people. Yeah. And, and I pray to God, you know, that we awake a lot of people to the fact that they're not buying fertilizer, they're buying poison. That's not making a nutritious food. And we're buying most of our food in the store that is actually empty calorie food and now you Even know vegetables why. and fruits right they have such yeah. little minerals in them because you know the plant will substitute and they will get by you know but they're not going to have a complete nutrition you've got to have you know available minerals bioavailable minerals and organic or forms well, what, well what's their bioavailable. thinking what's their thinking for the fertilizer industry giving people things that don't fertilize the soil i mean they don't provide minerals what's their thinking here i mean well because the cost the cost of those materials is far less and so the profit margin is a lot higher and so even though they might charge a little bit less their profit margin is far higher because the cost of the ingredients far less fewer ingredients mass produced chemically are going to be a lot less expensive but, you know, it's like food that's really, uh, really uh, contributing to a lot of health decline and diabetes and other issues, because most of our food is really nutritionally incomplete and also right. got a lot of a, a lot of a lot of uh, chemicals and pesticides. The pesticide residues are sky high because you've got to spray them constantly. Yeah. Like the strawberry farm to keep them alive and keep yeah. them from rotting in the field. But you have you you have a nursery and you have a lot of clients around uh, the the place uh, around Florida. Uh, do you uh, use pesticides or fungicides or herbicides? Not in the conventional sense. Instead of a Roundup, we use like a, a twenty percent acetic acid vinegar. You know, for weed control, and we'll use neem and. Uh, Pyrethrin, you know, a natural plant extract, like from the chrysanthemum plant, you know, for insect control and, and other natural ways, you know, like a hard spray of water, a lot of times will take care of you know, insects on a plant. Yeah. There's so many alternative ways, you know, and if we have to, we'll do the safest form, you yeah. know, like of a chemical pesticide like malathion that's yeah. completely degraded in one day, you know, to target Part of it is just keeping an eye on the plant, yeah. being a good steward, uh, watching your plants every day if you can, as often as possible, and then doing a targeted control of any uh, insect out outbreak or a fungicide outbreak. When we use natural things that are naturally good for pest control, we make fertilizer with all the good ingredients, including things that are not normally found in Florida soils to any extent, whatever, like, for example, available carbon, which is the most important element, 
in a bioavailable form. Because organic matter in Florida soil is very low. You need at least two to eight percent organic matter in the soil to have a healthy fertile soil with bioavailable, sustainable uh, availability of minerals in the soil. Our soils a lot of times are less than one percent organic matter. So we put bioavailable forms of humate in the forms of humic acid and fulvic acid that actually are bioavailable forms of carbon, particularly fulvic acid, which has far more carbon and hydrogen and oxygen in, in those very tiny molecules that exchange on a very fantastically greater basis. Like for example, if we're really healthy, we can carry maybe twice our body weight. We're in good, good condition. An ant can carry like four times its body weight, but a fulvic acid molecule, that tiny little molecule can carry 60 times its weight in 60 different minerals that become bioavailable as the plant needs them to exchange with the hydrogen that's given off by the molecule to really give it astounding results if you have a good fertile soil with high amount of humic and fulvic acids. And then we also put bioavailable silicon, which is the second most important element. As silicon dioxide with a volcanic pumice, we get actually from Nephi, Utah. It's a product we call azomite. It's a registered product. But we've heard people say from all over the world, really, how great it is. There was a gentleman that called me from Hawaii out of the blue. And he said, listen, I sell uh, glacial rock dust and I sell azomite. And I sell a lot of different products, but the azomite product beats the, the rock dust hands down. But I've had a lot of comments like that because it's nature's perfect mineralizer. And we include that in our fertilizers. We include bioavailable forms if we don't use the potassium chloride, we use potassium magnesium sulfate, the SPM, or potassium sulfate. And we use, you know, urea in natural form uh, and sulfur uh, in the form, you know, and magnesium in the form of keyserite, naturally mined. It's slow release. It's actually got 16.3% magnesium with the sulfur as opposed to 10% for Epsom salt. And the magnesium sulfate is another highly, highly soluble, very high solvent material. It's very dangerous for the soil and the microbes. That really makes the soil become unfertile instead of fertile. Yeah. But you want to use things that are released steadily and and, uh, yeah. and holistically. Yeah, your, your whole philosophy is that less is more, right? In, ter in terms of if you well, absolutely. It, then you're Once you get it. that epiphany, you realize like. For example, our 405 fertilizer will give you far better results like, than a 101010. If you look at a 101010, like I did. What's 10, tell tell us again, what's a 101010 versus a 405? Or tell us what that is. Well, a 101010 is basically ammonium nitrate, potassium chloride, and diammonium phosphate. Doesn't sound too wholesome, does it? Is that what most of the leading fertilizers are using? Like yeah, the big yeah. name brands? Is that what they're yeah, using? Primarily, primarily, or or ammonium uh, sulfate for the uh, nitrogen and the sulfur. And in the trace minerals in the 10, 10, 10, uh, I took off of a fertilizer label, had only four trace minerals, and they were all oxide forms that are unavailable to the microbes, so they can't digest them. Why are the we'll oxide them. forms? Release them in the ionic form, the roots can take up. How come the microbes can't use the oxide forms of those trace minerals? Well, cells? because it's like you've got a very heavy metal. Like, for example, let's look at iron. The, the four trace minerals in it are iron, manganese, zinc, and copper. If you look, uh, let's look at iron. You've got a real heavy iron atom, which has an atomic weight of some something like 28, and you've got oxygen atom that has atomic weight about eight. So you got a real heavy iron atom and a very light oxygen atom. And the molecular bond is so tight, it's bonded so tightly that the microbes can't break that bond. And so mm -hmm. they can't use it for food. They can't digest it. They can't uh, 
manipulated into a ionic form, a cation that roots can take up. So it's like a fraud upon the public when fertilizers include oxide forms of trace minerals. And that's what's typically in some of those 10, yeah. 10, 10. So to get availability, then you have to go to, to a chelated form like iron, EDTA, ethylene ditriamine. And that's only available at lower pH. Different chelate, the pH is higher, like the EDDHA, similar but a little bit different chemical compound. Even better, of course, is you know the sulfate form and and the sucrate. Well, what is the sucrate? Sucrate is actually an oxide with blackstrap molasses or sugar coated on the outside of that oxide. And then the microbes can start attacking and then utilize it and, and release the an ionic form. But the best is, I bet you know what the best availability of the microbes, for the microbes is. The sulfate, right? You like those? No, the organic form. Okay. Like like broken down from organic matter, you know, the, the decomposing leaves, oh, and yeah. organic matter breaks down the humus, mm -hmm. a different set of microbes breaks down the humus to the uh, humic acid, and then another group of microbes break it down to the fulvic acid. Then you're really humming. That's they immediately convert it into the ion form, the cation that the roots take up. But right. most people, you know, hear this misinformation yeah. about this is a really important point, you know, because the bioavailability you have to have bioavailable trace minerals as well as major elements in order to make a plant thrive and be healthy and productive are trace are trace minerals uh, uh a kind of afterthought or are they just as important as the major elements well they're just as important they they are equally important they give the color they they give the flavor uh and also many different things you know and the nutritional value and, and increase the polyphenols and the antioxidants that the major elements don't. And so you hear misinformation, you know, between the value or the nutritional value of organics versus conventional. Oh, there's no difference, you know, they'll cite NPK, there's no difference. But there's a huge difference that's been thoroughly documented, like in Rutgers University, uh, that there's far more polyphenols and antioxidants in organic foods because of the bioavailability bio of those organic trace minerals. So looking at it again, like that 10-10-10 we were talking about has only the oxide forms that are not available. And, and we explained iron and oxygen are very opposite Polarly speaking, yeah, the charge on the iron is like, like up there around twenty eight atomic weight of around twenty eight atomic weight of oxygen around eight, and so you've got a real strong molecular weight. This we've got a lot of binding power, uh, holding power versus a lighter holding power of the oxygen. Those two together, it has a very strong bond, and microbes mm -hmm. unable those mineralizing bacteria are unable to break that bond because it's so strong with the heavy atom and the very light atom. Yeah. And so it just sits there for years and maybe with weathering, a little oxygen or sun, and maybe a little bit's available over years, but you're not doing anything to really improve the soil or give yeah. available trace minerals that are going to make a huge difference in the value of the crop and the nutritional value of your food. Yeah. And so looking at the availability, you have to go then to EDTA, which is a chemical like iron EDTA or iron EDHA, depending on the pH of the soil, it's, it's, it's not all that uh, straightforward, but it at least takes at least 24 hours before the microbes are able, able to start digesting those man-made chelates. Okay, and then you go to sulfates, it takes a little longer, you know, for the microbes to start digesting the sulfates, but it's necessary, they can do it. And then, then you have sucrate forms, which is basically the oxides with a coating like a blackstrap molasses. And so you get all that sugar and uh, bioavailable uh, carbon from the blackstrap molasses 
that the microbes greedily uh, attack. And so then they can go ahead and, and digest all, all of that form in the, in the citrate form. But the most bioavailable are those digested organic forms. The microbes, the mineralizing bacteria can immediately attack those, digest them, and make the ionic form, the cation that the roots grab and take up and exchange because of the hydrogen, a high amount of hydrogen on the fulvic acid and the humic acid, primarily. So your, alternative acid. For, your alternative that you've developed is the 405 instead of the 10, 10, 10, right? Exactly. And so if you have good forms that are bioavailable and release gradually, uh, in fact, our 405 is 99% slow release. If it were chemical, they call it artificially control release, but the best is control the slow release in organic form because then you get all the uh, forms of the elements in immediately available form over a long period of time instead of just feast or famine like you yeah. would with a soluble high the, chemical the, that's killing most of the microbes yeah. anyway. Is your 405 fertilizer, is that something that is uh, designed for Florida primarily or something that all states can use pretty effectively? It, it's, it's designed for all purpose for all states because we've used it in all types of situations. We did a, did a test in our potting soil this spring with our 405, 8011, and our uh, 727 fertilizer. And all of us agreed here at the nursery that the 405 worked the best. And it's basically a complete organic form of fertilizer with, with a great set of ingredients. And, and that was started based on, available. you kind of developed that product. Probably you started thinking along those lines when you had that epiphany back in the 80s, right? Well, that degrees. started that yeah. started the epiphany, but there was another great epiphany I had. You know, if you have great nutrition, you have far more cold hardiness. I mean, it's the opposite of what you hear or, or most people perceive. Yeah, you can't fertilize in the fall or the winter because, you know, then you, then you set your plants up for freeze. Well, if you over fertilize, yes, but if you fertilize lightly or spray, you know, nutritional sprays, you know, in a reasonable, at a reasonable rate, at a low rate with everything the plant needs in a bioavailable form, you have far more cold hardiness. This is a great, great story. When I was working for the Department of Agriculture in Tiberias, Florida, as an inspector, they had a fancy name for it, but basically I was a plant inspector. And one of the nurseries I inspected had a citrus grove and, and a nursery greenhouse where they grew citrus seedlings and they produced Hamlin oranges in the grove. Well, here comes the December 1989 freeze, one of the hardest freezes in our in the in the 20th century. And so this grove was like a 30 acre grove. And his neighbor had 30 acres of an original 60 acre grove of the rough lemon rootstock with Hamlin cyan. Well, rough lemon is the most cold sensitive rootstock. And the Hamlin orange is, is, is the early orange, you know, that's a great one, you know, for processing for juice. Well, anyway, this was December, just before Christmas, 1989. And the temperature got down to 15 to 18 degrees in Mount Dora at this grove site. Yeah. So the gentleman's name is Bill Baker. He's unfortunately passed away and his son, Jim, has the grove now. But during that freeze, his neighbor pumped water like 15 gallons per hour from the, before the freeze started when the temperature was 35 and he kept spraying it long as the temperature was below 35 until the freeze event was over. And guess what? What, what do you think happened? <laughs> Every tree died wow. completely. Didn't save a single tree, without, even in spite of all that water because it was so cold. Bill, Bill Baker didn't do anything. He just had top burn, maybe a fourth of the top of the tree was burned. In two months, you couldn't tell there was a freeze. And I was astounded. I, I, I was just flabbergasted. And so I asked Bill, what'd you do, you know? 
you don't have irrigation, you didn't do any freeze protection, what'd you do uh, during the freeze to protect the trees? He said, I didn't do anything. I said, well, why didn't they freeze? He says, well, I sprayed a combination of trace minerals during the fall to, to get the nutritional status up in the trees. Now, that was a great epiphany to know that if you have good nutrition and don't overdo it, you can greatly increase but they were surviving 15 to 18 degree temperatures for yeah. two to three days. And so later during the citrus advisory meeting, we were talking about warning the growers, sending out a flash bulletin, you know, emails to all the citrus growers if the temperature was going to be 28 degrees or less for four or more hours to warn them, you know, protect their groves. So I'd had this experience, this epiphany, like we say. And so I said, well, why don't we also do a study of the, of the nutritional uh, status of the tree as a, as a function, you know, of the cold, of how, how the cold hardiness changes with the nutritional status of the tree. And it could, you could hear a pin drop. And, and so then the DuPont representative started talking about the chemicals and the, and all the things like, the bin laden, we know that are so horrible. It just went right on like I hadn't said a thing. So at the end of the meeting, the uh, one of the one of the big guys, you know, in the citrus industry came over to me like a big bully. And I said, Henrik, all you said was a bunch of bleep bleep bleep. <laughs> Censored, but it was like very very vulgar. Yeah. And I, you know, like, and I think that's the, still the thinking of most of the uh, uh, regulating agencies and extension and and the growers. They still have that mentality. So please, growers, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not talking out of my rear end. Yeah. This is a hundred percent true. What I'm telling you, you can make your trees a lot healthier, a lot more resistant to disease and to some extent insects and make them far more cold hardy if you give good yeah. high available complete nutrition based yeah. on soil testing yeah that yeah. is really the gospel truth yeah you know and i i gotta say for those in the that are not in florida that li we have people listening all over the world right now people in congo probably going to be trying to get a hold of that 405 at some point dana but uh uh, we got people well, everywhere. It's a combination of that, yeah. you know, yeah. and and the liquid sprays that yeah. have the trace metal. Make sure you have bioavailability. Do whatever you need yeah. to do to get the nutritional but, status. So everything is optimum as far yeah. as the but mineral speak, content of all the essential minerals, yeah. including things that are not normally tested for, like the carbon and the silicon yeah. that we test for that most people don't. Yeah. Well, speaking of. Uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, Florida as a case study and what you're doing, that was $11 billion industry in Florida citrus. They used to, in 1998, I think they packed 260 million boxes. 200, I think it's 260 million boxes. You probably know the number. In 1998, 2004. Something like they were, that. That was they were still 300 million. Yeah, 300 million boxes. And these are 90-pound boxes. Was it 90? What's the 90 standard pound box? 90-pound box. box. And so... You know, and now it's down to what? It's pathetic. It's you know they've lost everything because they've they've bet their whole farm on a uh, monocrop traditional industrial chemical fertilizer and uh, using uh, their in search just like in our medicine world uh, for humans, they're in the perpetual search for a genetic fix to the problem of a disease that has been what you call the scapegoat of the of the design of uh, of the def of the decline. Excuse me. Of Florida citrus or chemical fix, you know, can you believe they're actually injecting oxytetracycline into trees individually in a grove? Can you imagine? Yeah. It's killing everything, and so you have to keep injecting that tree to keep it alive. Because if you stop doing it, naturally, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to be attacked by the pathogen, and and it, it'll be died dying back again from yeah. the greening disease. What about, but that's not the yeah, answer. Yeah. Of course, genetic, genetics is important, but even if they have a tree that's temporarily resistant, unless you 
combine new genetics with good nutrition, the genetics will fail without good nutrition yeah. to support it. And yeah. So right now we can support the present genetics of the crow grow with good nutrition, good penetrating nutrition. So part of our program to rescue citrus groves, which we have done in a number of groves and we have good examples nearby, like Forrest Gallahan's Grove in Lake Helen, for example, and Dick Marshall's Grove in the land, where through good liquid nutrition and good granular fertilizer, like the 405 or the 811, depending on the soil test and, and other minerals that you need based on the soil test again, then you can get good recovery. Like we had groves where we've got rescued, we rescued where they were ready to push the groves. And because they use our nutritional products, then they got good, healthy, productive trees again. Right. For example, Forrest Gallahan's Grove here locally is the healthiest, most productive grove you'll ever see. And it was about to die four years ago. You couldn't sell the fruit. It was so uh, inedible. It was small and lopsided, partly green, partly orange fruit. And a lot of asymmetrical modeling on the leaves and, and, and the fruit either were dry or tasteless or yeah. just very sour tasting. But through good nutrition now. Uh, he, I've seen his he and I've seen grove. that I've seen that grove you're referring to with the, 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 the one that you're talking about. And again, just to give you an example, if you go to Florida today. You look at the groves and it looks like Halloween every year. You know, there's no leaves on the trees. Um, it just looks hellacious, like a, a vicious, a vicious thing has happened to the trees. Uh, and then you look at the soil around it and it looks like a, a chemical war zone in World War One. you know, where they were doing chemical warfare. And, and, and you look at the soil and it looks horrible. You see all kinds of heavy metals. You see no life, you know, no spiders are walking around. But when you go to that grove that you've rehabilitated with your program, it looks like the secret garden. Remember that movie, The Secret Garden in the British, those beautiful, lush walking gardens, you know, I mean, it's oh, just yeah. butterflies are everywhere. The, the trees are deep green again. And you don't see deep green leaves on Florida citrus trees anymore, unfortunately. When I was Except a child. on the groves like uh, Forrest Callahan. Yeah. Yeah, but and you're few a, and far between. That's a navel most, orange grove, the yeah. most difficult uh, yeah. citrus tree it's to and, recover from green. And unfortunately, too. that's few and far between because so many folks are still using the dumb conventional approach where they're spending. So let's put it this way. You're spending more when you do the conventional method than you are Absolutely. with this, and you're getting less results. It's, you know, that's Einstein quote, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's insanity. And yet well, people are wedded to it because they're mimetically – keeping up with the Joneses. That's what their buddies do. And so they just do what everybody else is doing. When you add everything up, including, you know, this, all the pesticides being sprayed and the chemicals and the herbicides and uh, all the expenses, like of the hypodermic uh, needle approach, you know, with oxytetracycline, you're talking about a, a small grower cannot survive with yeah. that. You have to be, and it's you, you know it's part of the greed too them. is that they're trying to create these methods of healing of this citrus greening disease that uh, benefit uh, shrinking competition, so they can shrink right. the competition and, and, and only and their buddies are in companies. power. Well, let's eventually, support some, let's support be some of these smaller companies that are doing the things the right way with organics that are actually bioavailable and yeah. and supply good nutrition. Yeah. So do, do you but, think do you think it's do you think it's okay to do monocrop culture or is it always going to be a tax on the soil eventually? Well, I I personally don't believe it's a good idea to have monoculture. Okay. Like for example, I was very blessed to go on a uh, people to people agricultural tour back in 1993. Yeah. Uh, like a uh, 12-day trip to China. And so I was, I saw what they were doing there and how they were approaching, you know, citrus and growing crops. And you won't see any monoculture in China. Yeah. I mean, you might have an orange grove or a, a apple orchard, but they have different crops intercropped, you know, in between. It's not just a monoculture. It's always a multiculture. Yeah. 
And so going back, though, to the recovery of the citrus tree, which is a really important point because Florida industry really is still greatly dependent on citrus. We want to stop the downtrend and, and turn the groves around and start an uptrend where the, the, the groves, the acres, and it's possible. We know it's possible based on what we're talking about to start increasing the acreage of orange groves, the productive groves in Florida and keep the cost somewhat manageable. And so, for example, going back to when Murray Boyd first became famous with his um, Boyd cocktail on his citrus grove, instead of pushing the grove of all the trees that had greening like his neighbor, he said, I'm gonna to try to save my trees. In fact, I helped him by adding the superhuman seedweed to his formula where he got that bioavailable carbon along with the other things he was using in his cocktail. But his grove thrived and he kept his production up and good quality fruit and, and kept a solid block of, of grove there and fell though when his neighbor was following the advice, you know, the chemical, the traditional wisdom. It looked like snaggle teeth, you know, of a person that had needed dental work because yeah. there were so many trees gone and the rest of the trees didn't look that good. And, and, and his neighbor's production was pitiful, hardly yeah. any left because he was trying, you know, to save the trees in a way that wasn't environmentally sound. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a little bit. Let's land the plane here by talking a little bit about the uh, what what kind of testing do you recommend for folks if they've got a backyard, they want to start gardening and try to grow their own food. They want a homestead. They got a, an acre or two, uh, and they don't know what to do with their soil. Uh, you know, you know how to, what what to do to keep it in good health to try to get microbial life abundant. What are your tests that you recommend? Well, I would start out. You know, if you just have one tree or a few trees. You may not need the test initially. You can mm -hmm. look at the symptoms of the tree, you know, and and get a good bioavailable fertilizer, a good organic fertilizer with a lot or a lot of organics in it, and it probably work. But if you are not getting any results, then get a soil test. It's very important, you know. If you're not getting results, you know, of putting the things you see from the nutritional symptoms on the tree, then to get a complete soil test, like a comprehensive test that tests not just for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but also for your trace minerals, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, and boron, at least for all of those. And, and preferably also for silicon, which is very deficient in Florida soil is a bioavailable form. And, and by the way, on on that particular element in Florida, our soils are seashell based, which means silicon dioxide, which it means that here again, a very heavy atom of silicon and very light oxygen atom. And so that bond between silicon and oxygen and sand, silicon oxide is unavailable. The oxide form is unavailable to the microbes to digest and make silicon available for the tree in, right. in a bio, in a monocylic, monocylic form. And so we put that in the fertilizer because we know that's a very, very important essential element. And we get that with azomite, the volcanic pomace we get from Utah that yeah. has over 65% bioavailable silicon dioxide. Then that's food. That's a great food for, for the microbial life. They readily digest that because then instead of that heavy versus light, then you've got the balance between one heavy silicon and two oxygen that balances out. Then they can easily break that molecular bond and then they add more oxygens, add two more oxygens, it becomes tetracyclic or monocyclic acid yeah. that has one silicon and four oxygen. And then it's, it's food for the plants yeah. and they take it up and people don't realize how silicon is an essential yeah. element for all these important functions in a plant. All right, for one thing, it it's responsible for the formation of the vascular tissue in the plant, yeah. the xylem and the phloem. It deposits a silicaceous or glassy layer over the whole plant, keeps fungi from penetrating into the plant, 
and, and nematodes from penetrating into the roots. This is all documented by research. Mm -hmm. It prevents lodging or the drooping of leaves. Silicon is responsible for keeping leaves properly aligned to the sun throughout the day as the sun is shining. That's the original solar panel. Yeah. Yeah, the leaves. Same material, yeah. That, that's fueled by the silicon. Yeah. Silicon is responsible for the glue along with calcium. Together, calcium and silicon forms the glue that holds all the cells together. That's the girders, like the skyscraper, you know, being held together with the girders of iron. Well, in yeah. the plant, it's that glue, a combination of silicon and calcium. Yeah. But that's just some of the functions. I mean, right off the top of my head, it makes far more cold hardiness. Yeah. More heat resistance. So it's it's amazing. And yet a lot of soil scientists don't even consider silicon, don't consider it essential, but it's essential for all those functions I just mentioned. How can you say it's not essential? Uh, and so the same thing with carbon. We overlook that in Florida because it's not routinely tested for, but in Florida, sandy soils or any other area of the world where the soil is real sandy and less than 2% organic matter, you don't have sufficient carbon. So that's the limiting element. So you can have a sickly, weak plant with white spots on the leaves and they don't know what's the problem. Yeah. And it's just maybe just basically carbon deficiency. But you have to have a complete soil test and have sufficient organic matter yeah. in the soil or put it like we do with a humate form that's got high uh, fulvic acid. In fact, our liquid products have in the fumate portion, humate portion have over 65 percent. Yeah. Uh, over 58 percent. I apologize. That's for the silicon. Over 58 percent bioavailable fulvic acid. Yeah. So you have very great viability of the carbon in available form with lots of extra oxygen and hydrogen, for example. Very good. And so you've got to have all those yeah. forms, you know, in a good mix based on a soil test, including things that are not necessarily needed, like in Minnesota with a rich, mineral-rich soil with high carbon and silicon and all the trace minerals. But in Florida... It becomes extremely important, or anywhere you, in the world where you have a lot of sandy soil, right? Seashell-based soil. Yeah. Now, what about would that? Would you still? Would it be kind of overkill then to put that carbon material uh, onto you know somewhere else? And if you're in a state that has not got that sandy problem, would that be overkill to put that type in there or no? If you put too much, but in any soil is going to be beneficial. And if you got a rich soil, keep it at a lower rate. It's like anything else. You want to be in that sweet zone like the Goldilocks. For example, if we're putting out humate material that's got fulvic acid and humic acid like we do when we put it in our fertilizers. As far as a rate per acre, you don't want to be less than like three pounds per acre of that material or more than like a about 20 pounds per acre of that material, along with a good fertilizer with all the other minerals. But if you if you go less than that or more than that, then you don't get benefit. In a rich soil, you go to the lower rate. In a real sandy soil, like here in Florida, then you go towards a higher rate. So you have response based on your conditions yeah. of soil. I'd like to uh, leave it here for now. And when we uh, maybe pick up next time, we can look at some photos of how to spot some of the mineral deficiencies in your plants. Oh, yes. I've got some good photos. Uh, and we'll, we'll do that as a follow-up. We'll do that as a follow-up uh, from this discussion. Yeah. So I appreciate your sure. time. I want people to go to your website, qualitygreenspecialist.com, where you can learn about Dana's nursery there and see some of his plants that they uh, have available and some of their uh, fertilizer uh programs and products that they've developed and sprays. Um, and then also you can call him directly at 386 734 That's 386-7-7-3-4-8-thousand. Uh, yeah, that's the nursery number. Call and, uh, and we'll be happy to give you the time that we can.
Yeah. But, you know, it's really important. What we're talking about is extremely important. I've uh, lived a lifetime and, and seen multiple uh, situations, many, many more than we've talked about. And uh, I'm telling you, it, it's a transformation of agriculture, if you heed what we're talking about. Yeah. And it can heal a lot of diseases. I like the holistic exactly. approach. It can heal diseases. It can bring a, the economy better for the local. It's better for the environment. It's better for your children's you know, health. And you stay There's, there's many it. ways to do it, but you've got to give good bioavailable nutrition support that life in the soil to give bioavailable forms of all, all the needs, not just the things that are conventional wisdom yeah. says, but including the available carbon and silicon and extra hydrogen and oxygen you get yeah. from that, uh, you know, rich, fertile soil with extra humates. Then you really, really are using all yeah. the wisdom of Mother Nature. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. And equalitygreenspecialist.com is his website. And again, if you have questions for us on A Neighbor's Choice, you can email me hello at a neighbor's choice.com. I'm David Gronoski. Godspeed. Thank you.